everything that's wrong with the world today, mm. almost to a to an event, mm. stems from a lack or a misunderstanding of manhood and masculinity. Oh yeah. Nine out of ten women who are getting an abortion said they would rethink the abortion if their paramour or boyfriend or husband was more engaged. According to the most recent data collected, one number the CDC reports is that more than half of abortions here in the United States, more than half, are women in their 20s. 70% of high school dropouts have no father. Come on. 63% of teenage suicide have no father. Yep. You know, so what we're seeing is when, when you don't have a father, tragedy follows. Where have all the men gone. Jonathan, so good to see you, brother. Yeah, good to see you, Chris. Hey, and look at the look at the black shirt club. We match. Brother. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like yours though. Thankful. One word says a lot. I like yours, the blank slate. Yeah, I didn't I have just... anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> Zero words. I got nothing to say, man. I just gonna turn my mic off. The black shirt club. <laughs> I'm telling you, like like hearted brothers, man. That's right. You meet people that are like minded, but every now and then. I only black have like party. five shirts, so it's bound to happen. Three of them are black. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so good, man. Men are simple. Men are simple. Speaking yeah. of, mm. man, we're going to talk about um, uh, where have all the men gone? Yeah, there is a there's a manhood masculinity crisis going on in our country today. Mm. Uh, you don't have to look very far in the news, studies, YouTube. You see this. People are talking about it. A lot of people are waking up to it really for the first time mm. um, at the expense of accelerating the achievement and advancement of women. Rightly so, we needed sure. to do that. The pendulum has swung the other way. Yeah, we've lost the men. And, and yes, we, we've lost them. They're, they're literally dying. Mm. Um, we're leaving them behind educationally, um, spiritually, vocationally, mm. men basically fail in, in every good category, and they exceed in every bad category. Yeah. Uh, depression, alcoholism, suicide, incarceration, you know, those are the categories men went in. So we're going to talk today just about this, just about this manhood crisis and, and really answer the question, where have all the men gone? Yeah. And, and what we see today you know, especially when you think about big men's movements of of the past. Mm. So I think late '90s, right? I think the whole Promise Keepers, Promise Keepers movement. Yeah. They were packing out stadiums full of men. That was right? big. It was huge. The Million Man March on Washington. You remember that? I think oh, that yeah. was like '97. I remember. And the whole idea was you had this generation of men who knew how to be men, mm. but they weren't. Yeah. So the the enemy was passivity, and the call was. Hey, you got to rise up. You got to be the man that you're created to be. Mm. You got to fight passivity and you got to, you know, do. Yeah. Today it's different. Mm. We've transcended beyond passivity and we're into what what I think is a just a generation of ignorance. Yeah. We we literally have a generation of men that don't know how to be men. Yeah, they were never shown, they were never taught. We don't know what to be, what to do, and who's telling them, right? Yeah, that's right. They didn't, you know, 41% of young men today uh, don't grow up with a father in the home. Mm. I want you to think about that, right? 41%. 41%. In 1960, that number was 4%. So fatherlessness is a crisis in and of itself. In and of itself. Yeah, so how are you going to know how to be a man, how to learn how to be a man if you, you don't have a man raising you, if you're not around that? Yeah, and a, and a single mother... Or a grandmother can do the best she can, yeah. But she can't teach you what it means to be a man because she ain't one. No, she's, yeah, she's not one. And then and you couple that, so you say forty. How much? What percent? Forty one. Forty one. Forty one percent fatherlessness, and then we have something like seventy uh, percent of high school dropouts have no father. Come on. Sixty three percent of teenage suicide have no father. Yep. You know, so what we're seeing is when when you don't have a father, tragedy follows. That's now. Right. There's grace and there's hope. And like you said, for those who don't have a father, God can move. For those who are raised by a single mother, God can move. For those single moms watching, God can use you. We see that with Timothy in the Bible. It was his mom and grandmother who discipled him. But what I would like to say is, hey, if you don't have a father or to the single moms, you know where you can find that example. You know where you can find that leadership is in the church. I'd love to say that. I'd love to say, hey, all these guys, 
You, you'll find it in the church. Go to the church. You know, Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I know a lot of y'all didn't have spiritual father. So I became that for you. Wow. And, and so he says, I'll be your spiritual father. I'll be your mentor. And, and so a lot of young men who grew up without a Christian father, who grew up without a father period, they found that discipleship, that example, that mentorship in the church. So I'd like to say, let's find it in the church. The problem is right now, 61% of the American church is female. Only 39% is male. So wow. they're, they're not in the church. No. The, the number of men in the prison is rising, but the number of men in the church is decreasing. Bro. So that means that 25% of married women who go to church go to church without their husband. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is five out of six American men will call themselves Christian, but only one out of six American men go to church. Yeah. And, and, and it's not about, well, we got to go to church to be saved, but we do need to be living in community. And we need to be growing together. And when you are, when you, the men are gathering as the church family, then they get to be those spiritual fathers. They get to be those mentors. They get to be those disciple makers, those examples to the next generation. But if we don't have men in the home and we don't have men in the church, then the question is, of course, where are all the men? Come on, bro. You, you just like pried open Pandora's box. Mm. Well, there was no soft land in here. We went right into it. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to waste any time. We're going to get to it. Let's go. Because <laughs> because what we're seeing, even that even that one in six guy yeah. that is going to the church, less than that have actually been discipled, hmm. have been mentored. So what we're talking about is what Paul describes in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, hmm. he looks at Timothy and says, Hey, young gun. That's the Texas translation. That's right. <laughs> hey, young gun, what I've taught you, I need you to teach to faithful men so that they could teach others. Oh. And you see four generations of discipleship, mm. four generations of mentorship, four generations of what it means to be a man passed down in that yeah. one verse. I love that. The one verse. What we have today, both inside and outside the church, if all those statistics you just said are true, mm. and they're true, this is what we do for a living. Mm-hmm. What we have today is a judge's two problem. Yeah, yeah. We have a whole generation of men that have grown up who did not hear, yeah. did not know, were not taught the goodness of God, the good things that God had done. So mm. what do they do? They go their own way. Yeah, if no one passed down faith to me, then I'm not going to pass down faith to anyone else. You don't have anything to pass down. And that's, like you said, that's even those who grew up in the church. I, I did a conference in Florida a few years ago, and at one point the, the ladies went, to one room with a, my wife, and I had all the men in one room, and I asked the men two questions. I said, how many of you grew up in the church? And there was maybe 40 men in the room, and I thought we'd get a majority, but actually every one of them raised their hand. I was surprised. I said, oh, every one of you grew up in the church? They said, yes. I said, every one of you have Christian parents? They said, yes, 40 for 40. Amazing. Praise God. I love that. So yeah. I asked them a second question. I said, how many of you grew up and you had another man disciple you Come intentionally? On. Zero. Zero. Not one. Oh, for 40. I, oh, for 40. I thought we'd get a few, maybe half. Zero. So, like you said, you got a generation, even in the church, who didn't have that Second Timothy 2 2 discipleship, didn't have a Paul passing faith down to them. So, they're not passing faith down to faithful men who are going to trust others also. And so, that reproducing discipleship, that generational discipleship, we, we've lost it. Yeah. And that leads to Judges 2.10. And, and you, you talk about the research. You and I were doing the State of Manhood Project. We do research. We read other people's research. And I'm telling you, everything tells us we as a nation are headed to Judges 2.10. 100% because inside and outside the church. So we've got 41% of young men growing up without an example. Mm. We've got the majority of people sitting in church without an example. Yeah, And you can't become what you can't define. Oh, if no one's good. defined it for you, if no one has, has shown you the example, mm. then you can't become it. And, and here's what we're seeing. You know, you think about the two most followed men today when it comes to life, social media, et cetera. Uh, I think about Jordan Peterson, yeah. right? When it comes to young men, oh, yeah. he has millions of followers. And I think about Andrew Tate. Yeah. Right, millions of followers, yeah. and and what do Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate have in common? Hmm. Is they've both given men a path. Hmm. They've showed men a design, a definition. Now, not a very healthy design. 
Yeah, it's not always biblical. Not a great <laughs> definition, but they've showed them a path. And men are hungry for that. And they're hungry for that. So this is what we this is what we see when when we talk about or ask the question, where have all the men gone? So I typically come across three types of men, three or four types of men today, yeah. right? The first type of man is the uninitiated man. It's what mm-hmm. I call the uninitiated man. Uh, he doesn't know what it means to be a man. He's never been given an example. Uh, so typically, he just kind of slow quits his masculinity. Mm-hmm. And and you can see him, like, like you'll notice him in the mall or at a restaurant or in public. He's usually six or seven steps behind his wife mm-hmm. with his head down, mm-hmm. pushing a stroller, carrying a diaper bag, mm-hmm. doesn't really think for himself. Doesn't really speak for himself. Yeah. Doesn't lead in any kind of way. Yeah. He just he just takes kind of the back seat in an unhealthy way. Yeah. yeah. In an unhealthy way. Not in a like humble way. Yeah, it's not that I'm serving, it's <laughs> I'm lost. Yeah, and I've and I've quit. I'm defeated, I've quit. Yeah. Exactly. So so you have the uninitiated man. Second type of man we see is what I call the self initiated. Mm. This is the guy that um is following Andrew Tate. Okay. Right, I'm going to get mine. Mm. Right, this is the Invictus man. You know, my head is beaten and bloody, but I'm bowed. I'm the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. Right, I'm going to get what's mine, and I'm going to take years along the way. Right, and and this guy, hyper alpha male, Mm. right, Um, toxic masculinity. Oh yeah, he's he's exerting all types of of just destruction. Right. Unhealthy sexual desires, unhealthy mm. desire for fame and to be liked and to be mm. known, and and basically uh, he'll just crush anything in his path to to get what he wants. Yeah, it's a very selfish posture and any perceived strength, and we we know it's really just another form of weakness. But any perceived strength is just worldly strength. That's it. It's not what we see in scripture, right? It's it's not the power with meekness that we even see in Christ. It's just this worldly definition of strength, worldly definition of manhood. Yeah, and that and that's so good. I don't want our listeners to to miss that. You you said the word meekness. You know, when it, when I think about Jesus, mm. and I've studied scripture a lot. Mm-hmm. There's only one time in scripture that I know of where Jesus says, "Come and learn from me." Mm. And he says two things. "Come and learn from me, lowliness and meekness." That's Those good. are the two things he references. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Matthew 11, baby. And, and we know no one's ever been stronger, right? Jesus is, you know, that meekness, as many have said, meekness is not weakness. Meekness, one author defined it as strength or power under control. Come on. It's Jesus standing in front of his accusers, knowing with one word he could wipe them all away. That's right. And yet out of love, out of obedience to sacrifice. the Father, out of sacrifice, he, he allows the cross to happen. And he does it willingly, does it joyfully, does it for you, does it for me, does it for all these men we're talking about, right? Come like on. there, there is now, because of his meekness and, and strength and power and glory and salvation, because of the cross, all the men watching, there, there is a better way, which we'll talk about part two. Come on. And, and again, listeners hear that real strength isn't, isn't repping 515. Right. Real strength isn't deadlifting 600 pounds. Right. It, it might make you strong. Sure. But real strength is having authority, mm. having influence, having power and control over someone else, but withholding that authority for the good of that person. Yeah, even if God does allow you to throw up 500 pounds, it's so that you can then serve others. Come on. Right? Like the Come muscles, on. the strength, the gifts. The personality, everything he gives us is meant to bless those around us instead of just, you know, add more to our bank account, add Come more to, to our reputation, to our fame, to our glory. If we're using the things God has given us to build a kingdom for ourselves, we've missed it completely. Hey, I heard Adam Tarnell give the best definition of leadership I ever heard. Mm. He said leadership is simply having someone else's best interest at heart. Wow. That's, That's leadership. Good. And it's what it's what Dallas Willard said said love is. Love is having someone else's best interest at heart. Mm-hmm. And I love I, I I don't agree theologically everything with Dallas Willard, mm. but but I do agree with this. He said God's chief aim, think about this. God's chief aim is to look upon the earth and find men he can entrust with his power. I love that. Because as men we want to do good image, right? we, we want to do one of two things. 
we want to either abuse that power mm. or equally as bad, we want to neglect it. Yeah. That's, that's the uninitiated two and the self-initiated. So right? what's the third guy? The third guy is what is what I call the peer initiated or the university initiated. Think, think um, what's that? What what was that movie with Will Ferrell? Old school, the, those fraternity mm, guys. Yeah. Right? So it's the guy that's tasted some semblance of brotherhood, mm. but, like, he never outgrew it. So he's the 60-year-old adolescent frat guy. Yeah. Right? So instead of ironing, sharpened ironing, I call it um, two butter knives clanging <laughs> together, just rubbing up against one that's another, right. right? So he just lives in this extended period of adolescence. There's mm. no real growth. There's no real maturity. Yeah. Um, he's got a Jimmy Buffett-type theology, no shoes, no mm. shirt, no problem, <laughs> right? He just He's just out there in the wind, and uh, he's, he's not stable. Like, mm. he's the guy... That if you want a good time, you call him. Yeah, yeah. But if you're in a hard time, you'd never reach out to him. <sighs> call for a good, fun time, but don't call him for a hard time. Yeah, or anything serious, right? Mm. Right? And some of you are listening to this right now. You're that guy. Yeah. Like the only time anybody ever reaches out to you is when they want to do something fun. Uh, but they don't reach out to you when they need something, like for their yeah. soul. And well, that's comes a back problem. to what you said, right? Like if leadership's having other people's best interest. Then when I need someone to have my best interest in mind, I'm going to call a godly leader. That's it. I'm not going to call the guy that just wants to have fun or want, wants to go out and party. I'm not going to call the guy that has no uh, truth to speak to me or affirmation or encouragement, right? If they have nothing to give, then they're not going to lead me because they can't have my best interest in mind. That's it, 100%. So, so I see, I see those, um, the uninitiated, the self-initiated, the peer yeah, initiated and and men men flock to these to these kind of pers- personas mm-hmm. because there's a pathway. Yeah. Right? What is the Bible talks about where there's no vision people perish, right? Oh yeah. The Bible talks about the your steps being ordered by the Lord, right? Mm. The Bible talks about going in a certain certain direction. You and I have a a mutual friend in Chris Shirley. Yeah. Dr. Shirley over at Southwestern. Mm. I remember in his class learning that discipleship is not a destination. Discipleship is a direction. Mm. You're heading in a direction, and that direction that. is towards the ultimate man, King Jesus. That's so good. Like, that's the direction you're going. That's and so and here's the reality. Men are not living in neutral. Yeah. We're either, we're either going towards him or yeah. we're going away from him. Well, like you said, we, we want to be moving. We want to be on a path. In, in, in the ideal world, there's godly men around us giving us that Chris Shirley discipleship path, that discipleship direction, giving us that spiritual leadership. But in the absence of that, like you said, we're not just going to stand still. We're going to go find the discipleship from the world. That's it. The world's going to disciple us. The world's going to give us that pathway. In the absence of spiritual leadership, something else will fill the void. And we have this example in Genesis 34 of Jacob and his family. Jacob is a would-be, could-be, should-be spiritual leader of his home. And in Genesis 34, tragedy strikes his home. His daughter is abused, raped, taken advantage of. The the boys hear about it. Jacob hears about it, and Jacob doesn't say a word. He gives them no guidance, no direction, no leadership. He doesn't even seem to grieve or mourn. And it's not that he's just not an emotional guy. When he thought Joseph was dead, he wept. Yeah. And so this is a guy that can grieve, can show emotion. This is a guy that we see really in the next chapter, I think, show some godly leadership. But in Genesis 34, we don't even see the name of God in the whole chapter. Wow. There's no prayer. There's no leadership. So what happens? In the absence of spiritual leadership, something else fills the void. So her brothers, Jacob's sons, they take it upon themselves to go deal with this crisis. And they basically slaughter an entire community of men. And at the end of the chapter, there's this moment where Jacob and his boys are there. And Jacob is looking at them like, how could you do this? How could you, you know, take out a whole community of men? You know, now we just made enemies with all these people. And the chapter ends with them looking at their dad and just asking the question, what were we supposed to do? Come on. What were we supposed to do? Uh, You know, in the absence of spiritual leadership, something else will fill the void. In the absence of biblical discipleship, Men will chase after worldly discipleship because, like you said, we want to be moving. We want to be on a path, and we're going to find it from somebody. And so the prayer is that there would be godly fathers, godly husbands, godly men in the church providing that leadership for a generation of Jacob's sons. Brother, that's so powerful because 
because where I get frustrated is I'm I'm done with both the secular and the sacred beating up on these young men. Yeah. Right? Telling them um, how bad they are, mm-hmm. telling them, you know, what they're doing is wrong. Yeah. When when in all reality, these men are looking to the church. They're mm-hmm. looking to the generation before us and they're saying, mm. what were we supposed to do? What were we supposed to do? Like, like that's a question yeah. that we've got to address. Man, what were we supposed to do? Mm-hmm. If we're not willing to give them a pathway, mm-hmm. if we're not willing to step up and look at the next generation and say, hey, follow me as I follow Christ, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Not perfectly. Yeah. Not yes. perfectly. As yes. a matter of fact, I've messed up. A dozen times. Yes. Maybe you're only going to mess up 11 times, but follow <laughs> right. me, right? I'm That's one right. step ahead of you. Follow me. And if we're not willing to do that, then we can't lament about the problem. Mm. We, can't, we can't criticize others, mm-hmm. right? Until we're willing to step up and say, hey, listen, we're going to be for this generation of men. Yeah. We're going to be for the next generation of men oh, yeah. and provide them a path, a path forward. Until we're willing to say that, then we can't, we can't lament everything that's going on. Because to your point earlier, Everything that's wrong with the world today, mm. almost to a to an event, mm. stems from a lack or a misunderstanding of manhood and masculinity. Oh yeah, I'm talking about every societal ill oh, yes. that 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 the church wants to lament about. I I, I think about abortion. Mm-hmm. Okay, nine out of ten women who are getting an abortion said they would rethink the abortion if their paramour or boyfriend or husband was more engaged. If the father of the baby was more engaged. If there's a presence of a father. Not so the absence of the father, you, you could see abortion increasing 90% maybe. We're, we're, we're spending billions of dollars and countless hours fighting abortion. Mm. Legislation. Mm-hmm. Supreme Court. I'm talking... Billions of dollars in countless hours. Yeah. When the reality is, we get to the boyfriends, mm. we get to the husbands, we get to the men, bro, abortion goes away. We reach a generation of young men. We provide biblical discipleship for a generation of young men, and we see revival in this issue. Revival. And transformation. Transformation. Think about incarceration. Mm. Incarceration. So, do you know how they forecast building prisons? No. They forecast building prisons. How many prison cells, prison beds will be needed in the future based upon second grade reading averages? I had no idea. I never heard that. 100%. Second grade reading. So they test second graders in second grade testing. They will take those reading scores. Hmm. And based upon reading scores, they can forecast the number of prison beds we're going to need 10, 15, 20 years from now. Right, because they're saying if you have a low reading score, we we think there's a lack of some sort of mentorship, leadership, teaching. Hundred percent. Right, you're you're not getting something you're needing. There's a good chance. And the down the road, in the home, it's going to have these consequences. It's right, going to have Which these I, consequences. I believe it because they also say that ninety percent of runaways, teenage runaways, ninety percent of homelessness, fatherlessness. That's it. No father. That's it. And so, yeah, and we know once you run away from home, once you don't have a stable family looking out for you, a lot of times you feel like crime is your only option, leads to prison. So prison cells are filled with men, and the churches are missing the men. That's a path. That that um, life of crime or life of mischievousness, whatever it is, mm. right, that's a path. Mm. Again, if there's not a path, the world will disciple you. Mm. The world is always willing to show you a path, right? Mm. And and I want to clarify something too here because we've went in we went in pretty good on fatherlessness, mm. right? And what I would call a, a true or a real orphan, mm-hmm. right? Somebody that grows up without a father in the picture. There's also what I call functional orphans, mm. right? This would be, um, I mean, this is personal to me. I grew up very much with a father in the home, yeah. but he was emotionally, physically, spiritually detached, mm. right? So in some ways, I think it's it's worse for the functional orphan or what mm. I call the half mm. orphan, right? Because the orphan orphan, he can maybe forget what he never knew, mm. but the functional orphan, he's got to grow up in a home with a father that he has to see every day and be reminded that he's not wanted be reminded oh, every man. day that he's not being led. Every day there's that reminder that every I day. want his attention. 
I'm not finding it. That's it. That's it. So some of you, some of you men listening, some of our viewers, um, they are creating functional orphans. Mm -hmm. Like you think you're doing a good job by working 50, 60, 70 hours a week and providing for your family. Yeah. You think you're doing a good job by um, having your attention divided and, and running hard over here when the reality is your children just need your time. Oh, man. Your children just need to see a good example. Your children just need you to lead them spiritually. So we're just not talking about the actual orphan. Yeah. We're talking about the actual orphan is 41%. Could you imagine if somebody did a study on functional orphans? Yeah. That we're never definitely has in the majority to be, now, right? I mean, it has to be 80%. So we're more than half the nation, maybe more than two-thirds of the nation. And, and what is so many have said it so well, they said the only people who will remember that you worked extra hours, late hours, 20 years from now will be your kids. That's it. You know, that hits. There's a survey just a few years ago that said by the time kids reach middle school age in America, the average parent in our nation only spends 15 minutes of real conversation with their kids a week. Good God. 15 minutes a week. Now, they're eating dinner, but you've seen families at restaurants. They're at the restaurant, and what are they all doing? They're all looking at their phone, all of them. That's it. Right? I mean, we, we know the reality is even though parents get at least 3,000 hours a year at home with their kids, research is telling us only 15 minutes a week, only 15 minutes a week of that is actual meaningful conversation with their That's kids. It. Dude, something I've become super convicted about lately, uh, and I've actually I've got a blog coming out about this in a couple of weeks, but – I just recently learned that the average American picks up his phone 144 times a day. A day. Okay. And I didn't know your iPhone could track this. So about two months ago, I started tracking it. Hmm. My average, I pick up and look at my phone 121 times a day. Right there. Right, what the research says? That's amazing. I didn't even know you could track it. You could track it. So you know how it, like, it gives you that screen time report every yeah. week? There's another button. If you just hit it, it goes in deeper, and it shows you. It's called pickups. And it's how many times you pick up and look at your phone. 144 times a day. That's amazing. I don't look up at my wife, and she's, I mean, oh, she's yeah. beautiful. Mm. And I don't look up at my wife 144 times a day. I don't engage my children 144 times a day. You know what else That's I don't convicted. look at 144 times a day? The Word of God. Word of, some would say they don't look at the Word of God 144 times a year. Come on. I mean, we're talking 100. That's a big number. If they would just make iPhones weigh a little bit more, we'd be ripped. Can you imagine 144 times a day working out? I mean, if this would be a 25-pound phone, you know how strong I'd be? At least one arm. That's a, but that no, is so, like you said, it's million, convicting. Hey, that's, hold on. we got to acknowledge this $10 million idea you just had. <laughs> The 25-pound weighted iPhone. <laughs> Your right arm would just be jacked, bro. Absolutely I need two jacked. phones, <laughs> one for our right arm, right for our left. I, I would be so strong. But if the Bible weighed 25 pounds, would it even make a difference? Like, uh, are we picking that up we'd at probably, all? We'd probably pick it up less. Yeah, we'd be like, oh, it's not worth it. It's not compact They can make the enough. phone whatever they want, and we're still going to find a way to pick it up. Absolutely. We're not going to not pick it up. But to your point, and... That, you know, I told you I was convicted about that because what I'm learning is my device is discipling me instead of me discipling my device, <sighs> right? And it's, 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 again, where there's, where there's no path, the world is going to offer a path. Mm -hmm. The world is going to present a path. And sooner or later, whether that's the path to slow quit your masculinity and become uninitiated, whether that's the path to um, ramp up your masculinity and become this hyper alpha male, right? I see this all the time. You mm. see this all the time on social media, on TV, man. These guys that you know they do nothing but but work out and drive fast cars and chase women, right? And they're they're applauded for this. Yeah. Or whether that's a, that extended adolescence, right? Oh, you're yeah. you're you're eventually going to choose a path, and and what's going to happen is. We're going to be asking the question, where have all the men gone? And instead of, like you said, instead of just being critical 
of the next generation. You know, I hear this a lot from adults. What's wrong with that next generation? What's wrong? Maybe the question is not what's wrong with them, but where are the men who are going to disciple them? Right. Tony Evans does a great job with this. He looks at the fall of man in Genesis 3. You know, the first family, the first man, the first married couple. We get Adam and Eve, right? God gives Adam everything he needs. He gives him a home. He gives him a wife. He gives him a job. He says, I put you in the garden. Work the garden. So he has a job, a home, a wife. He has God, fellowship. And this is in a perfect world. He has everything. He has everything. And he still is with his wife, and they fall into the sin. He, he blames God for putting her there. He hides from God. And Tony Evans does a great job of uh, capturing that moment when the first man, the first married couple, the first family have sinned. Adam then tries to cover his shame, cover his wife's shame. Then they hide from God. God comes in the garden, and he asks a simple question, Adam, where are you? And Dr. Evans goes all in on that asking our culture, our generation today, hey, Adam, hey, godly men, where are you? And, and I think we're doing the same thing he was doing. We're covering our shame. We're, we're hiding from God. We're fearful of God. We're leading our family even to hide from God. And, yeah. and that question almost just lingers throughout Scripture, throughout history. Hey, Adam, hey, godly man, where are you? Where are you? And, and let's pick up on that theme for just a second because recently a new study came out um, – the guys down in Orlando, Jim Davis, um, mm -hmm. Ryan Borges, uh, they call it the de-churched. Oh, yeah. So we're living in this era that's been called the de-churched. In the last 20, 25 years, 40 million people have left the church. And and men are leading in this exodus, as sure. you referenced earlier, yeah. on any given Sunday, 61% women, 39% church, 39% men. In the church, uh, yeah. And then in midweek services women are eight times more likely to be at a midweek service. I heard that too. Yeah, 80% of those going to Wednesday night Bible study, women. Uh, prayer groups, whatever. Any type of, of spiritual advancement throughout the week, absolute women. And then that shows up in all age categories. Mm. So whether that's, uh, you know, big church for the adults, youth church, young adults, children's church, Come on. the same demographics. Mm. Um, they're even saying... Christian colleges and Christian universities today are being called convents because they registered two women for every one guy. I read the, I read an article at a Christian university at their school paper where the women were saying, where are all the men? That's where right. are all the young men? Where are they? They're not there. And that's so interesting that in our culture, you're still seeing women in the church. You're still seeing women yeah. midweek Bible study. You're still seeing women in the university, Christian university, that's, you know, doesn't seem to be changing, but the men seem to be decreasing in every area. Absolutely. Every age. And, and what this is, it's a response to, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in our state of manhood, which I cannot wait yeah. for it to come out in a yeah. few weeks. But it's a response to that early church growth movement, you know, mm -hmm. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There were two guys, Daniel McGavran. Robert Schuler, they wrote yeah. that book, you know, How to Grow Your Church. And, mm -hmm. and when you think about it, in the 70s, you know, the mega church, kind of seeker-friendly church, I think there were 50 of them. By 1990, there was like 400. And then by 2001, there was 1,500 yeah. of those type churches. So Grew the, quick. the church exploded, mm. right, especially larger churches. And, and McGavern and Schuler basically said three things, right? And you can go back and read the book. Mm -hmm. The first thing they said was, was really kind of terrible. They said, McGavern specifically said it was the will of God that churches remain homogenous. Yeah. Like the churches should all look like one another. Yeah, that, that breaks my heart because I pastored, as you know, I pastored a church in Houston for 10 years, and we were intentionally multi-ethnic. We had 50 right. different nations in our church. And I remember reading the same thing, McGavin saying in the 70s, you'll grow faster Right. If you focus on one ethnicity, but then we look at scripture and we see God's heart for the nation. So yeah, that that's heartbreaking. And and a lot of churches followed the pattern. Not not only did they all look like each other physically, but they all shopped at the same area. Oh, yeah. They all drank the same coffee. They all went to the same schools. Mm. I mean, you think about Saddleback. You think about Willow Creek. Like these mm. churches were built in that model. Mm. You know, and I'm not I'm not throwing shade on anybody. I'm sure. just this just is what it is. Right. Right. The other two things in there. If you wanted to grow your church, so it needed to be homogenous, you needed to reach children and women. Mm. If you could reach the children and women, your church would explode, which is why you saw an era of just massive expansion for children's ministry. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
literally billions of dollars oh, yeah. were poured into youth and children and children's churches and youth centers and the yes. whole nine yards. And the idea was, man, we'll get the children, we'll get the women. Things started becoming feminized, the aesthetics, the oh, language, yeah. the songs changed. Oh, yeah. And eventually the men would come. Well, guess what? It didn't work. The men didn't come. Yeah, and I'm and all for And the ones you had are leaving. And I'm all for reaching women and reaching kids, but really now what the research is showing is if you would reach the man, you reach the family. That's it. And, and that's what the recent research, you know, you and I both read Christian Smith's book, Handing Down the Faith, sociologist professor at a Notre Dame University book came out a few years ago, and he, he's the one that wrote the 2004 book, Soul Searching. He's the one that coined the phrase moral therapeutic deism, deism. right? That's right. And, and so a few years ago, he has this new book come out, Handing Down the Faith, and he's just trying to answer the question, what needs to be present in the home in order for faith to be passed down from one generation to the next, right? Great question. You know, how are we going to reach that next generation? How are we going to see a revival and a change to all this trajectory we're reading about? Now, we know, and I'll just say this caveat real quick, we understand God can save anybody. 100%. And I have friends who grew up in a Buddhist household. No one in their neighborhood was a Christian, and God saved them. That's right. Right, and so just hope To the real uttermost. Quick. Yeah, so if you're in a home right now and there's not one Christian, just know the Lord can save you. If you're a single mom right now trying to do things on your own, just know the Lord can use you like he did Timothy's mom in a mighty way. Like he did my mom. Exactly. So we see God doing those things. But Smith's research also showed that when men are leading, when Christian men are in the home and their faith is genuine— it is much more likely that faith will be passed down to the next generation. And yeah. so, yeah, instead of McGavern's goal of, hey, just reach the women and the kids, what, what if we reach the men? What if we reach the fathers? And, and I really think that what we see even biblically, uh, examples in Acts 10 and Acts 16, and what, and what we see in our research is that if you would reach the men, you'll reach the next generation. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a game changer. Yeah. It's a game changer. And at some point, we've got to wake up to this. Yeah. And we've got to start taking our time, our talent, and our treasure and investing back in mm. the men. That's you know, good. we call the state of manhood. We're not winning men back to the church. We're winning the church back to men. Yeah. And it's going to take an intentional investment. Listen, to your point, God is a God of order. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean God can, can't can take disorder and make order. That's right. what he does. Yeah, he redeems. I mean, he took a chaotic ball of nothing and made the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what he does. He's a God of redemption. Mm. But at the same time, he's a God of order. Mm -hmm. And when you follow his order, things go well. Yeah. Yes. When you don't follow his order, they yeah. don't go as well. <laughs> it's that simple. simple. It's simple. that simple. Well, and Tony Evans does a good job of showing that ripple effect. Right. And That's you right. start here. How does it, and he does it both ways. And I'll never say it. I mean, he's one of my favorite preachers, so I could never say it as well as he does. But he goes all in on this. And he basically says when, when you have these men who are lost, men who even spiritually they're on cruise control, they're apathetic. When you have what he calls messed up men, if they're in a family, they're going to make a contribution to that messed up family. And if that family's in a church, they're going to make a contribution to that messed up church. And if that church is in a community, then they're going to have make a contribution to a messed up community. And if that community is in a city, then is, they're going to contribute to that city. If the city's in a state, now you got a messed up state. If that state is in a nation. you got a messed up nation. If that nation's in the world, you have a messed up broken world, right? And, and he started with the men, and you see this ripple effect impact everything, right? 100%. Dennis Rainey said, no family, church, or community will rise higher than the spiritual condition of its families. And I would just add, no church, community, or nation will rise higher than the spiritual condition of its men. Let's go. But what's beautiful about it is Dr. Evans then goes backwards. And, and he says, so if you want, want to see a, a world that is revived, if you want to see a nation that is revived, then you need states that are revived. If you want states that are revived, you need cities that are revived. If you want cities that are revived, you need to see light in the community. If you want to see light in the community, you got to see revival in the church. If you want to see revival in the church, you got to see revival in the home. And if you want to see revival in the home, you got to see revival in men. And, and he brings it backwards to that ripple effect, just as a, a generation of lost men will impact everything around them. A generation of men being discipled, a generation of men chasing after Jesus Christ, I believe we would see radical revival Come from on. the family to the church to the nation. Dr. Williams, this is why you are my hero, bro. <laughs> that that was phenomenal. I said I, I won't say it better than Dr. Evans, so go watch Dr. Evans. He, he preaches <laughs> it a lot better than that. Two things we're walking away with today. 
won, men are lost. Yeah. And we've got to see a revival amongst men. Mm. Next week, we're going to talk about how we get there, mm. how we do that. That's good. But the other thing, 25-pound iPhones. <laughs> Going to make us rich. I, I want some royalties from. If someone does that, I, I want a little royalty from that. Listen, we copyright and trademark in that <laughs> right, right after this episode, brother. I love you. I'll see you next hey, week. Hey, you too, brother. Thanks.